This is The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention, featuring pro athletes who have leveraged their athletic minds for success beyond sports. I'm your host, David Gardner, a professional basketball player turned CEO of branding firm Color Jar. Hello, hello, hello. This is The Big Jump, and I am your host, David Gardner, and this episode is a bit of an experiment. Rather than the usual interview format where I sit down with a pro athlete who has created success beyond sports, this is a solo episode, or if you prefer, a solo-sode. This is the first of these, and if you're thinking about making your next big jump, this episode is for you. This is not a recap episode of season one. You know, a lot of you reached out during season one with some version of, hey, I love the interviews and I'm inspired, and I'm thinking about my next big jump. So what works for people and what holds them back? And, you know, I know that for every one person who's reached out with a question about reinvention, there's likely many other people sitting with a similar question. So what does hold us back from reinventing ourselves and writing our own story? Well, the thing that holds us back, that reinvention killer, is actually ourselves. So today's episode is about you. You see, there's something that we all do but we're blind to it. It's invisible to us. And it really is a reinvention killer. Now, I don't have a silver bullet, but my hope is that what I'm sharing today will help anyone who wants to spark their next big jump. First things first, though, as a super quick aside, this solo episode marks the end of season one. Yep, all six season one interviews have been released. And yes, I am happy to announce that the recording of season two episodes is well underway And the first one is just two short weeks away. So if you haven't already, make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Over the course of season one, I have absolutely loved hearing from so many of you who have been inspired, and there's a lot more inspiration to come. And while staying inspired is important, let's get back to that invisible thing that holds each of us back from our reinvention, holds us back from writing our own stories. On the trailer for The Big Jump, I said that humans were meant to grow, to change, and at key moments in life to reinvent. And I've learned that the core blocker to reinvention is being put into a box. Everyone's heard that phrase, being put in a box. When someone tells you what they think you are, what they think you're supposed to be, or what they think you can't be, this is the stereotype box, and nobody wants to be put into it. So most of us get caught up fighting the stereotype box, wrestling with it, and getting distracted by what others are, quote, doing to us. And in the midst of fighting to avoid the stereotype box, we completely miss the fact that there's an entire second box. A box that's harder to see, but is most certainly there. The invisible box. This is the box we put ourselves into. And in my experience, the invisible box is actually the more powerful one. The invisible box is constructed by our beliefs and fears and is self-made. I can't change. I'm not enough. I'm not supposed to do this or be that. I call this invisible box syndrome, IBS. Yep, there's a new IBS in town, and it can stop your growth, really. You know, it can stop you from writing your own story without you even knowing it. The idea of invisible box syndrome is based on a mashup of my learnings. Learnings from conducting the season one interviews, from putting the big jump into the world, ideas from teachers of mine, as well as from my own experience making my big jump from professional athlete to entrepreneur. I'll say more about the invisible box in a moment, but I don't want to gloss over the stereotype box because while the invisible box is worse, the stereotype box is still a bitch. Most everyone knows what it's like to be stereotyped, profiled, or just sized up. I'm no different, and I encountered the stereotype box a bunch while creating season one. Uh, Let me share with you a a quick story. So the day after the podcast launched, I was sitting in the green room of Chicago's most watched morning television show, waiting to go on, nervous, and getting mentally prepared for my first live TV appearance. And little did I know, I was about to get a dose of the stereotype box. Someone from the station came in, a super nice guy, and he says to me, so you're a retired pro basketball player and you started a podcast? It threw me. Uh, I guess that's technically right, I say, and I think to myself, retired pro player? That's not what I identify as. And I tell him, well, yeah, I played pro basketball, but I'm the founder of a brand consulting and design firm, and now I also have a podcast. I feel like I'm fighting to be seen for who I am. And so he leaves, the clock ticks, I'm still nervous, 
Then a producer comes into the green room. A lovely woman, very focused. She's there to go over their intro script for the segment. And she asked me, so the podcast interviews pro athletes about life after sports. I rise from the faux leather chair to meet her at the doorway. And I say, well, sort of, no, not exactly. And in my mind, I'm quickly scanning through the season one episodes. Chris Humphreys built a budding business empire during his 13-year NBA career. Mason Plumley is a current NBA player and has impressive off-court pursuits. Christine Magnuson and Ryan Mundy got graduate degrees while competing in their pro sport. And Rachel Bueller Van Hollebeck took the MCATs a month before winning Olympic gold. So I tell her, no, it's not about retired athletes. It's about human reinvention. It features pro athletes who have reinvented themselves and create success beyond sports. Beyond sports, not after sports. She got the message and walked quickly down the hall. So I get the go-ahead to exit the green room. I walk through a door and stand on the side of the TV set with cameras and monitors all around. And I watch the anchors behind their desk deliver the segments leading up to mine. A car crash, a shooting, something about politics. But, you know, I'm in my head. I'm a mile away. I'm thinking about what I want to say, using these last moments to harness my nerves. And my focus is interrupted when I hear the anchor say, after the break, former pro basketball player David Gardner interviews pro athletes about their life beyond sports. Some retired. <laughs> Some retired. I guess that's a start. Both that day at the TV studio and throughout the process of creating the big jump, I encountered a few different stereotypes and they seem to fit into themes. And I want to share those themes with you with the thought and hope that there's something universal in them that you can take back and think about for yourself. So the first one was be one thing and one thing only. People assumed athletes are only athletes and do nothing else, at least certainly not until after retirement. So taking this back to you, the listener, where have you felt the expectation to conform to a single identity? You know, to just be one thing. Mason Plumlee talked about how his first team all NBA teammate, Damian Lillard, would get harassed on social media for his pursuits in music. And Mason said, yeah, he does music, but he's first team all NBA. I'd hate to know what people would say about me. So have you felt the pressure to hide your passion project or your side hustle like Mason or his teammate? Have you felt like you'd get judged negatively for doing more than one thing? During the creation of season one, my grandfather passed away at age 93. He was a renowned psychoanalyst and a watercolor painter and an author. I like that. So think about this. Does doing what you truly want seem more difficult because it doesn't line up with how someone else currently sees you? The second stereotype is what I'm calling the trophy that won't go away. I noticed that the label retired pro athlete would stick around no matter what the person was doing next. So a pro athlete remains a retired pro, even though almost all of us become a pro in something else beyond sports. So I ask you, is there an accomplishment in your life that you're proud of, but you feel like you can't quite move beyond? I heard that Shaq's dad would take away his childhood trophies the day after he won them. Go earn another one, he'd tell Shaq. He didn't want him to become satisfied. Are others around you trying to keep your old trophies in front of you, holding something notable about you as the thing that defines you, limiting you from what you're currently working on or who you're currently becoming? And last but not least, there's the whole shut up and dribble thing. The idea that athletes are all muscle and no brains. This came up in the episode with Mason Plumley, and I pointed out that nobody wants to be reduced to their physicality. That mean lady from Fox News telling LeBron to shut up and dribble is like somebody telling her to shut up and smile. So applying that back to you, when has someone sized you up or attempted to shut you down? Have you been told that because you do X, you can't do Y? Or maybe you want to move from a career that's seen as more physical to a career that's more cerebral. Say you're a carpenter becoming a writer. Or perhaps you've been told that your body's the wrong size or shape or color. Or that you've been told that what you do today disqualifies you from what you want to do tomorrow. All of these examples, these themes, this is the stereotype box at work. And in the grand scheme of stereotypes, given the world we live in, these are comparatively minor offenses. You know, people are people. They want to classify and bucket and size things up. And so fighting against human nature or for social justice is not my point here. I'm focused on how the stereotype box affects your ability to reinvent yourself, your ability to write your own story. In my experience, stereotypes only have power if we ourselves believe in them. 
A stereotype gets in the way of your growth when you start to listen to it, or worse, engage with it. Which brings me to the invisible box. The invisible box is self-made, it's limiting, and it's even more detrimental to our reinvention, our ability to write our own story. It's invisible because we're often unaware of our own behavior patterns. Or as the saying goes, we're like a fish in water. If you've always been in water, you don't even notice that the water's there. And what we don't notice about ourselves, the water in this case, it's our mistaken beliefs, our unhelpful patterns, our self-limiting behaviors, and our fear. And I think that fear is a great place to start. Ask yourself, what do you often fear? What do you often avoid? Where do you often hold yourself back? And as you begin to observe yourself, you'll begin to see that we limit and hold ourselves back more than the world around us does. And it makes sense why. Humans want safety and security, and it's scary to become something new, to become someone new. Perhaps that's why on episode five with Ryan Mundy, when I asked him what it was like to introduce himself as a tech investor the first time, he simply said, it was scary. And that makes sense because change is hard and reinvention can be scary. It's scary because we put ourselves into boxes. Though the boxes are entirely self-made, we get comfortable there and it feels risky and it feels like you're exposed to show up in new and different ways, to exist differently than we had previously known ourselves. So the root of invisible box syndrome is fear. So how do we break out? How do we beat the fear and go for it? Mason Plumley talked about reframing fear. If he was afraid of something, he took it as a sign to approach it. Fear became something to go towards, not to run from. Plumley's example is that he knew he'd get made fun of to do a rap video as Plum Dog Millionaire. And he was right. He did get made fun of, but he did it anyway. And guess what? The sky didn't fall down on top of him. But in doing so, he faced a fear, and as a result, he grew. Remember, the win isn't always in the outcome. Mason did not become a rapper. The win is in the doing, because the doing is what breaks down the walls of the invisible box and starts to beat invisible box syndrome. Everyone's been to the zoo and seen a tiger pacing back and forth the length of its cage. At a seminar, a teacher of mine showed a video of a tiger in a huge cage, but pacing back and forth in a small section of it back and forth, back and forth, in a 20-foot cage, but pacing at a 10-foot span. You see, the tiger had developed a pattern in its previous smaller cage, and that kept up, despite now having a much larger cage available to him. We're all capable of twice as much than what we currently know, or how we currently behave, but we hold ourselves back out of habit and self-belief. That's invisible box syndrome. It's out of comfort, out of habit, It's in our programming and all those unconscious rules that we often don't realize are the things that are holding us back from becoming our next best selves, our reinvented identity. In episode one, Chris Humphrey said, you can't let fear dominate your life. You have to teach yourself along the way and it's risky and exciting. And in episode two, Brooks Like said with conviction that he's got one life to live and that he wants to do it all. But we get in the way of our own growth. You, me, Chris, Brooks, everyone. That's human. And we do it far more than we'd like to think. The job is to own up and notice how and where we're limited by our self-imposed invisible box syndrome. And when we see it, the job is to break down those walls a little more each day. How? Make a small bet on yourself. Take a risk and approach your own walls, your own limits. Because the small win is in the doing, the trying something new, not in the outcome. And enough of those small wins will add up over time. And soon enough, you'll have knocked down one wall of the invisible box, then another, and then another. And that's when you're really free to reinvent yourself and write your own story. That's it for now. And I do want to say before I sign off that it's been a joy and a privilege. People use that phrase a lot, but I really mean it. A joy and a privilege to bring this podcast to you. And I'm so excited for you to hear season two. You know, one moment I'll never forget quickly was the night of the big jump uh, launch, June 18th, 2018, just two months ago. And I was working late, making the pre-launch push at the Color Draw office with Priya and Shireen from my team, as well as Riley, who's working in Canada with us. And all of them really deserve a ton of credit for bringing the big jump to life. So I see this push notification from Apple that the first episode is officially live. 
And with a huge smile on my face, I pack up my things to head home to my then fiance and now wife, Laura, who is ever the tailwind behind me, steadfast in her support for really all my endeavors, even when they uh, coincidentally line up a bit too closely with our wedding date. Thanks for putting up with me, Laura. So I, I stepped outside of our office into a perfect Chicago summer night. I took out my phone. I see the big jump album artwork in the podcast app for the first time. From idea to reality, there it is. Month of hard, months of hard work, nights and weekends, flying to interview each of the incredible guests. It all culminates uh, with the first press of the play button. And I do it, I hit play. The intro music hits my ears. I thrust two hands above my head into the instinctive victory pose as I walk beneath those sidewalk street lights. And tears of joy stream down my face. I'm giggling out loud into the night like a lunatic. And, you know, there was only one download at that point, my own. And I couldn't have possibly been happier. This project is a project of passion. In fact, at the time of recording this, I still haven't looked at the download numbers because much more rewarding than those vanity metrics are the incredible words from the listeners about how much the podcast has touched them uh, because really that's what touches me. And yes, I am still human. I have an ego. I think it's cool and fun to have the podcast covered by the media. Uh, and my awesome sponsor, Grand Voyage, is going to want to see those download numbers soon enough. But all in all, I really feel like we've got something here. And I say we intentionally. No creator wants to create alone. And you listening are as much a part of the big jump as me and the guests are. I'm really grateful for the tribe that's growing around the big jump and season one is only the beginning. So catch all of you soon for season two. Until then, game on. I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in LA and handcrafted in Italy. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And I always say, if you're changing up your game, you better look the part. So use promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. By the way, my favorite item has got to be the blue burnished leather high tops, which are handcrafted in Tuscany, Italy. So go check them out. See what I mean. Yes, blue leather high tops. Go to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you. Show notes covering key topics and sources for this episode are available at thebigjumpshow.com. And remember to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, because there's a lot more coming from The Big Jump real soon.